Hi, welcome everyone. Welcome to the second day of Sustainable Earth 2021. I'm Ian Stewart. I've been director of the Sustainable Earth Institute for the last five years. And back in 2016, when we initiated this conference, we wanted to bring together researchers, we wanted to bring business, public sector, civil society, and community groups and individuals. And uh, this year is no exception. We've got something like 1,100 people registered, a quarter of them students. Um, and yesterday we got kicked off with an excellent day hearing about the uh, the difficulties of net zero and the climate emergency from keynote speaker uh, designer Sophie Thomas and the delusions of net zero from uh, our opening speaker, climate scientist Kevin Anderson. Um, it's been a vibrant mix of parallel sessions on the built environment, on transport, on behaviour change, on the role of art. In, in the climate emergency, along with a, a panoply of pleasures in the in the marketplace, and and um, what started off with a sobering viewpoint about net zero from from Kevin Anderson ended with a very sober viewpoint in the UK premiere of the film Eight Billion Angels, a, a film that examines the the tricky issue of the role of population in as a root cause of many of the issues around a uh, population and consumption, I should say really, in terms of the socially ecological uh, crisis, featuring our very own Professor Jason Hall Spencer and the work that he's been doing on ocean acidification. So it's going to be more of the same today. Um, we've got, a, a, we've got a, a range of activities bracketed by a couple of fantastic keynotes, the first looking at systems thinking, the second on the role of business, and culminating in a kind of, in a pressure release valve, really, of a, a closing talk from uh, climate economist by day and stand-up comedian uh, by night. So it's going to be loads of fun and frolics. And to get us underway, um, a view from our sponsor, from, from the Vice-Chancellor of University of Plymouth, Professor Judith Petz. So Judith, I wonder if you can join us. Thank you, Ian. Um, I'm, I'm not often called a sponsor, but thank you very much. And it's just amazing to think that four years on, we can't all be together where we normally are um, on campus for this great conference, but somehow that means we've got even more people participating than it's normally possible to have. So it's great to see over a thousand people at Sustainable Earth this year. And um, it's, it's fabulous to have that range of interest and particularly welcome to all the students that are participating. That's uh, really good to see. So Ian asked me if I would just say something about um, a, a, a role that I've played. Well, actually, it's two roles that I've been playing over the last two years. And that is as a climate commissioner for higher education, um, which I'll say a bit more about, and also leading a group in Universities UK for all of the so nearly 150 institutions that are part of, uh, of Universities UK around climate action. And this has been very much sparked, of course, by preparing for COP26 in November. But there's a much bigger issue behind that, um, which the universities have been exploring, and which I can just sort of say a few headlines ab about. Um, universities are at the forefront of climate action. There is no doubt about that. And, and of course, in the first place, it was university science that actually has been identifying analyzing and explaining climate uh, change and our need for climate adaptation. And so universities are at the heart of the science. Um, and of course, they are also at the heart of teaching and what we might call climate literacy, which is absolutely crucial um, to ourselves as this generation, but also to the next generation. So the university role um, is recognised as essential and world leading for many of the UK institutions as well, and is behind some of the work we've been doing as a team of universities. Um, our role, of course, is actually in delivering multidisciplinary and in interdisciplinary science, because this is not just about understanding why climate is changing and how far it might change. It's actually understanding how humans behave and respond and how our whole systems of living and our ecosystems will respond. It's important also to understand how adaptation will, will be required and our building of resilience in our communities. And therefore, the link with sustainability 
and the Sustainable Development Goals has been absolutely at the forefront of our thinking throughout. This is not just a climate discussion. This is truly a sustainability discussion. And seeing it in that sense has been something that the university discussions have been very strongly around. And then it's about the role of universities in their community, in their regions, in their local areas, in their partnerships with business, and of course, in their partnerships internationally and how they can actually build on those to build an international response and adaptation. So if I just say something about the universities themselves, and we've been doing some work to see how we can position universities and also drive university behavioral change. And the first thing to say is that like many other organizations, there's huge diversity across the university sector. Some universities who have in-depth environmental science, like Plymouth, have been doing climate action, climate response and sustainability for decades. And that's certainly the case at the University of Plymouth, because we've been able to feed off our own in-house science and expertise, as well as our ability to work with our partners locally, regionally and beyond. But for other institutions, perhaps often much smaller, perhaps quite specialised, say in the arts areas, it's far more difficult because they don't have the in-house resource. And so even in the university sector, where we all understand absolutely the importance of climate response, there is inevitable and quite understandable diversity in response. And one of the things that we've been doing with Universities UK is trying to develop a policy position um, that all universities could sign up to and follow in developing their climate action and their sustainability response. In fact, that policy paper is being discussed today by the Board of Universities UK to sign it off so that we can publicise it and universities can pick up on it. And importantly in that conversation has come across the, this isn't just about driving to net zero, this is far more than that. It's about our response to sustainability and our response in signing up to the UN SDGs accord in particular. And so that is behind our policy response as a set of universities. It is certainly about the ability to set institutional targets, to monitor and report on those in terms of climate action. But again, because of the diversity of institutions and with people in different places at this point in time. In the UK, we won't be suggesting that every university has to set a specific scope one and two. We're merely saying that the, the targets that they set as institutions should be at least as stretching as the government's own plans for reducing by 78% by 2035 and for achieving net zero by at least 2050. Actually, at the University of Plymouth, we have set 2025 as our scope one and two um, target for uh, net zero for scope one and two emissions. Scope three, a little bit further out, and that is very common across the sector. Scope three is still quite difficult for many in the sector to get their heads around in terms of where they can have most impact most quickly and changing their operations. The other thing we've been doing is really putting together the story of universities' impact on, uh, on climate research and understanding and on sustainability. And we will be running in the autumn, in the run up to COP26, a Made at Uni campaign focused entirely around universities in the UK's response to sustainability and climate action. And I think that will really bring home, hopefully very much in a public forum, the role of universities. We've seen the role of universities in science absolutely over the last year in the COVID response, and really perhaps a raising of public understanding of the power of universities and what they do. And we hope that the Made at, Made at University campaign in the run up to COP26 will do the same for our role and responsibilities in sustainability and climate response. I want to say a little bit about um, the Climate Commission, which is actually a partnership between EAUC as our, our lead uh, association and organisation for environmental response and sustainability, um, Guild HE, which is the smaller universities, Universities UK, who I represent on the Climate Commission, and uh, the Association of Colleges. 
And this is a climate commission for both the higher education sector and the further education sector. And here I think I've seen something really I hadn't really appreciated before we started the work last year. And that is for many of our colleges, our further education colleges, who are often major partners with universities and certainly here in Plymouth, we partner with six to seven colleges across our region um, in skills delivery. For them, it's actually far more difficult to get onto the net zero bandwagon because they don't have the internal expertise and resources. So we started with um, an action uh, plan for further education and have developed also a toolkit for higher education on how to um, respond and take climate action. And those have been two major outputs from the Climate Commission. And the toolkit is an evolving document with case studies in and examples covering everything from the responsibility of boards of governors and the, and the governing councils of universities right the way through um, the leadership of, of universities. And it is at leadership level that we have to take that drive and responsibility right the way through our staff and our students. And it responds in all ways as to how we can operate in terms of our estates, how we build our campuses and expand them, how we drive our net zero through our procurement chains, how we uh, operate internationally. Here, of course, quite a difficult um, tension between our operations internationally, our attraction of international students to the UK, and what that means for our net zero goals right the way through to how we invest in our investment policies as well. So the toolkit is there to help universities. It will be added to with case studies and more examples and is live. And the same has been developed, as I say, for further education colleges. And we've done a large number of presentations, conferences and events in the year to find out what people need further advice on, particularly, for example, scope three emissions, particularly around issues like offsetting, and particularly around that big tension around international operations, so vital to university roles internationally in terms of science delivery and driving climate action around the world, but also how do we make our footprint of our international operations um, as climate and sustainably friendly as possible. And then the other thing that the Climate Commission has been doing is working, and some of the colleagues in it, working with QA, um, QAA, uh, Quality Assurance Agency in the UK, and Advanced Higher Education, Advanced HE, uh, to a, a sustainability curriculum guidance for universities. That has already been picked up by quite a lot of universities. And this is about how do we embed sustainability and climate response into all of our subjects, not just our environmental and our engineering subjects we expect it to see, but into our nursing and health. Uh, medicine and dentistry, and I know you've had uh, contributions already uh, for people in those fields, right the way through to our arts and social sciences. How do we embed into skills development and climate literacy um, uh, in, uh, in our institutions? So between the Climate Commission and the work we're doing in New UK, I think we've taken some real strides this year. There's a lot more to do. We all know that, and I'm sure that's been part of the conversation already and will be today. Um, but we have a responsibility as universities. We are there to take a leading role. We have expertise and resources probably beyond many other organisations. And we can be major partners in our local communities in helping communities and, um, and uh, businesses to respond when perhaps they don't have the resources. So that's the, the work that's being done. Uh, very exciting, immensely proud of what we're able to do in universities, but recognize we still have further steps to do. And importantly, it's not just about net zero. It's about our whole building of adaptation and resilience and our delivery around sustainable development goals. We're talking about the future. We know that even if we could get to emissions reductions at the levels we want, we will still have climate change it will still be significant for many communities. So we have to still adapt and build resilience. And that's why the Sustainable Development Goals and our work to those is so important. So thank you very much, Ian, and everybody. Um, and uh, I hope you have a great day today.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Judith. Thanks for kicking us off. So let's crack on, really. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to, to welcome up uh, Dr. Anna Burney, our first keynote speaker. Anna is, is a Director of Learning at Forum for the Future and also Director of the School of System Change. And it's that on that uh, point of systems thinking, the approach to sustainability, uh, the sustainability challenge that she's going to be talking today. Just a couple of things as we we bring, uh, I'm just going to bring Anna up. Um, in terms of, there's a hashtag as ever with these things, it's hashtag Earth Forum 2021. There's a discussion column here if you want to put the uh, questions in and we'll pick up with those at the Q&A. But until now, I'll step off and I'll let Anna carry on. Thanks. Thank you, Ian. Uh, good morning uh, to everyone who's watching. Uh, I've been asked to frame up, how do we respond to sustainability and why do we need to consider a systems change approach? And what does that actually mean anyway? So it's a time to step back and to frame up, um, frame up the challenges that you'll be addressing later in today. So let me uh, just share my screen. Um, great, so why do we need to consider systems change? Um, well, we all know that COVID is affecting us. It is the first shock of a decade. It's a moment of uncertainty, of discontinuity. Things are changing. And, and it's really brought us to understand that, uh, to understand what might come. Um, we think it is the first shock of a decade of different shocks. You know, the climate emergency will have impacts on um, on the world that we see. Um, so we know that we need to do something about it. We know we need to navigate that future. Uh, and it's shown us how interconnected the systems that underpin our society, our environment and our economy are. Um, and so what do we do about that? And how does a systems change approach help us? Well, firstly, we can start understanding what are the dynamic big themes and issues that are going to be affecting the next decade. In our future sustainability report, as we were exploring this systemic nature, we looked at five key dynamic areas. Firstly, we know that biosphere breakdown, um, climate, but also in our forests uh, and other ecosystems will be uh, breaking down. It will have a massive impact on the way that we um, the way that we operate in our food systems, our energy systems. Uh, and it has, has a big impact on what we're doing. But we also have seen massive inequality and we have to think about how do we transition equitably? Uh, what does that mean for people uh, and their humanity as we have to create the change over the next decade? We also know that it affects our economy. There will be, you know, crises or a need for reform. How will how will we respond to that? What's happening there? It will be more disruption uh, across our economy. And also, what is the role of government and tech? Um, how do we make decisions? What's the policy? Um, how do these things start impacting the work that we do? But we are seeing some hope. We're seeing regenerative openings, uh, new models, people exploring that, not just across um, agricultural systems, but also across social systems, uh, across the economy. Uh, and that gives us hope in terms of uh, new models and ideas that are emerging. So that's the context of why do we need to consider um, systems change is the world is disrupting, the world is changing, it is dynamic, and it's time to transform the way we do things. So how do we start thinking systemically? How do we use that perspective uh, to some of these big issues? Um, first of all, we need to acknowledge in this kind of iceberg model uh, that all these different issues are happening at multiple levels. They're happening across the physical structures, but also our societal structures and also uh, deeper in the undercurrents, uh, the undercurrents of the world. We need to understand the mindsets, the feelings, the psychological reactions we might have to these changes as well. So taking a systems change approach really is about how do we understand these different levels, these different ways and how they affect us and affect uh, the work that we do when we're trying to address issues like the climate emergency. So I present uh, an iceberg model that we use at the School of Systems Change and, and we teach different change makers across um, policy and business and civil society. And we got to start not just paying attention to problems uh, at the events level above the surface, but really need to dig under what are, the, what are the trends, what is happening and repeating itself. But more importantly, what are the deep structures? What are the deep structures in our economy, in our governance structures that are affecting the patterns that we're seeing? And also what are our mental models? And I'll return to that in a minute, about how do we use the different mindsets or mental models that underlie 
our systems to help us understand the pathway we might need to take over the next decade. So um, using this model, we might start thinking about, so I know that these are some of the themes from this conference, the built environment, mobility, transport, energy, food and diet, and we at Forum for the Future work on some of these issues. How do we transform our food system or how do we address issues in energy, for example? But we need to understand these not just as themes, but start thinking them as systems, start thinking them as interconnected. We need to start understanding of what the real goal is that we're aiming for. So one idea that we might bring today is when we're thinking about the issue of food, for example, we might ask the question, what is its goal? What is its function it's serving? So we talk about nutrition. The goal of the food system is actually nutrition. And the goal of the transport system is actually mobility. So when we start reframing uh, some of these issues and think about what is the, the function the economy is actually serving us, it's actually about how we move and exchange resources, how we have services and products that we can actually, um, we can actually exchange and, and work together to, to fulfill our needs. So the, the first question we might ask when we're looking at these themes is, what is their function and goal that they're serving us? How, how does the built environment create shelter for us? Uh, and this on the right hand side here is a uh, is the Donut Economics by Kate Rayworth, uh, trying to show that we can't look at these themes as separate. They are providing our social foundation as well as our ecological ceiling. And so we need to understand how we how these things work to, together to create a safe and just space for us to operate in. So then we also might need to understand the underlying structures. We might need to understand that actually the, the role of the economy and governance and the relationships of these things have a big effect on the way uh, we might create change. So it's not just about thinking systemically. We, we use systems change because we might need to understand not just intervening at a level of, uh, for example, behavior changes here is one of your themes. How do we also understand the deeper structures under, under behavior change? What, what is causing us to behave in certain ways? Why do we live and work the way we do? What, what, is the, what are the deeper questions that we need to be asking ourselves about uh, the cultural narratives that we're living within, about the communities that we're embedded within? What are the infrastructures that are supporting us to get our food from different places, the supermarkets to maybe local growers? How are these different structures working together to create our system that might be really important to think about as we're exploring change? across these systems. So yeah, how do we start systems approaches really on a simple level, thinking about the relationships, the relationships and the underlying structures. And, and I want to really get us thinking about how do we think economically and from a, from a decision making or governance perspective, and how does that affect um, what we might do and how we might go about creating the change we want to see. This is an example. I don't expect you to, to, to look at it or read it. I worked with Ian on the Scottish Climate Assembly. Uh, it's just sort of a background uh, example of when we use this iceberg model, we start thinking about, yes, we might ask ourselves questions about our diet, our lifestyle, our work and travel above the above the the. The, above the waterline, but we need to start thinking about, okay, what are those systems underneath it, the energy systems, the mobility systems, and what are the deeper the deeper structures, that the inequality in, uh, that might be there, the just transition, the dynamics and the patterns, uh, and what are the structures of civil society and uh, what impact does ecological collapse have down there on the left-hand side. So I guess this is just a, a background image to show how we can use these these different framings and systems thinking to get us to think about, well, what is actually happening in the system, you know, to affect our lifestyles? How might we understand agricultural manufacturing systems? How might we understand retail or uh, the, the technology or finance? Um, and we need to understand where we might leverage the change in these different places to affect the outcomes we want to see in the world. So what next? Um, what does this actually mean? And this is where I want to touch upon the, um, the question of our mindsets. Actually, a lot of uh, the way we see change uh, is really important for system change. How we understand the mindsets we bring to the work that we do can affect the pathways we choose. And when we were looking last year at the future of sustainability, we were see and, and, and effectively what was happening with COVID, we started to look at Forum for the Future, four different mindsets that were affecting our 
uh, how we might come out of COVID. But at this, we could easily put the climate emergency at the center of this diagram as well. We could say, well, actually, these different disruptions, these different um, these different effects that are, are seeing in society, we can understand it by understanding different mindsets that we might bring that will take us on a pathway, uh, pathway to change. So I'm going to talk through each of these mindsets briefly and to think about what do these mindsets mean for how we might address these thematic areas? How might they affect the structures? How might they affect the outcomes that we're seeking? So first of all, there's the discipline mindset. And, and you know, at the beginning of COVID, it was really, it's really important to have discipline. It's really important uh, to, to kind of have lockdowns and, and to, to ensure that we have some sort of order in track and trace. So there's greater control in this mindset to maintain public health and safety, to keep growth and global interconnections the new normal. So, but there are some challenges with every pathway where there are some questions and concerns about how much control or how much discipline do we need when we're addressing the climate emergency? What does it mean to re relinquish our privacy? Do we want everything digitalized? Do we want to know what's happening and where? How much we're using carbon budgets or, or household budgets? Um, what, how much control and discipline is needed to address the change? And some is, but it can also... Uh, not necessarily take us down a path which gives ourselves the community ourselves and communities the agency we need to transform uh, in this world so that's the first mindset the second one is compete and retreat and we've seen this quite a lot in some ways the positive side of this is that we need to think about community we need to understand that we need to um, retreat back to our, our local areas and our, how we support our local community. But there is a part of this mindset. There's also, there's not enough to share. We must retreat and protect our own kind. And this just perpetuates inequality. Our survival and prosperity comes ahead of the survival of others. And we know in sustainability, and especially when we take a systems approach, that taking that mindset doesn't actually create planetary and, and, and social health. It doesn't enable us to live uh, fully and with abundance for the future we want. So we need to be aware of this mindset of what, how much we might need to, to, to look at it in, in an initial reaction about, okay, uh, we are, we're affected by the changes that we're seeing. We might need to retreat and reflect, but how do we not let it get to the point of, of only looking after yourselves and then not thinking about the wider social and ecological health of our systems um, that, that is needed for the, for the future we all uh, hope are seeking? The third mindset is about the unsettled. Now, this mindset, we didn't know if to put it as a separate mindset, but it is there. This idea that there is no new normal. You know, my children, for example, this week have, uh, are, have been sent home from school because they're self-isolating. You know, we think we're coming out of the pandemic here in the UK, but then you realise that the disruption is, is continuous. There is there, we, there is no new normal. The, the world is now strange and it's volatile. And we're really waking up to this realisation. And this isn't going to change with these other these other dynamics, these other biosphere breakdowns and, and inequitable realizations. So how do we continue to work with that? How do we create resilience in ourselves and our communities and the work that we're doing? Um, we need to think differently. And so how do we create adaptability um, and opportunism um, without creating that fatalism and anxiety? So it's this kind of unsettled can kind of put us in a place of feeling complete chaos um, feeling like we have no control. But there's also something useful about recognising that this exists, recognising that, um, that, that, that we, are, we are here and we, we need to adapt. Uh, and, and that's what we, we're living in this time of volatility and discontinuity. So what does it mean to, to embrace that and to work with that and find some peace in that as well? But the final mindset is, I guess, the one that we at Forum for Future are saying we would like to, to take a path down and to, to work from this place. We kind of say that planetary health and human well-being come first um, and they are interconnected. 
So deep change to reset the system is possible and desirable, and we can't go back to what's before. So this idea of a regenerative and just future is what's needed. We need to look at these regenerative openings, the, the dynamics that are emerging, and start thinking about how do we use a mindset of regeneration and justice as one that can help us transform. How do we start embedding that in the that mindset in the structures that we are constantly co-creating on a daily basis? How did that start playing out in, in the impact that we're having? So I really invite you as you go through this second day of your conference is to think about which mindset uh, am I using or I'm coming from when I'm discussing this issue? Am I coming from a mindset of um, discipline, of, of control? Am I coming from a mindset of chaos, of uncertainty? Am I coming from one where actually I, I need to retreat back? Or am I coming from a transformative, the idea that, that, that change is possible, that we can create the change that we want to in the world? So, um, Finally, I will sort of say, uh, and I think I'm uh, way above, uh, way below time, which is great because we have more time for questions and interactions with you folks. So please do get ready with your questions and comments. Um, so understanding system change, we need to understand it as a process and an outcome, that the system change is the emergence of a new pattern of organisation or system structure. The idea that we are looking at how things can change and we need to look at that at the structural level, the flows, but also understand the relationships and ways of organising the power in the system towards new goals. Like how do we how do we understand sustainable nutrition, sustainable mobility? How do we understand energy systems that are really working towards heating and lighting our, our world? And how do we understand the pattern of our thinking and mindsets that underpin the change that we are, are looking at? So system change is both the outcome we want to see, the structure and pattern that we want to see in the world, but it's also the process by how we create change, this process of using the mindsets, of using our understanding of what's happening underneath the system to, to, to find better solutions, to, to continually work with a very changing world. So why do we need to consider systems change? Well, it's a time of disruption. We need to work with that changing world. We need to pay attention to the not just the problems above the surface. We need to look at the structures and mindsets under it. So therefore, we can start addressing some of these issues at its root cause. So thank you very much uh, for inviting me to, to speak. Uh, and I'm open to having a discussion with you, Ian, and the participants. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. That was fantastic. It was a bit scary seeing that mural board of the Scottish Climate Assembly systems one, but that was fantastic. Uh, uh, for me, fantastic experience. Mm -hmm. So uh, we got a, one question that I thought we'd start with from Anne, Anonymous. It says, systems change is frightening. Changing the status quo that the majority follow and understand. We can examine the current system, but who decides what new systems we adopt and how do we avoid chaos? It can as a thread that's run through your whole talk, but can you pull out some of that stuff, that, that fear of veering off into chaos? Well, it's not so we're veering off into chaos. I think it's, it's, it's mainly saying, like, how do we have our own agency in the future that we're creating? So the transform trajectory is really saying, how do we, how do we own in whatever sphere of influence that we have? So really thinking about we have agency over our own lives and it might not be massive. Um, we can't, we're not collectively deciding what our structures are in society. We don't have, we, we, you know, that's very much a discipline mindset of controlling. We're actually just co-creating our world on a daily basis. So how do we bring in, you know, how do we bring in a bit of agency or sense of security in ourselves for saying, well, how am I in the work that I do in the, the way I live my life, the products I buy, maybe how I grow my own vegetables or how, how I choose what transport I take? How am I choosing to create the world I want to see and choosing the structures around us? And then a lot of us have jobs or doing research if you're at university on some of these big issues. So how do you start bringing this in into whatever sphere of influence that you have? Does that kind of answer the question, Ian? Yeah, I think so. And there's a few, the discussion is a mix of questions and dialogue on this. And so it's, you know, it's a messy business. But so there's two things that are linked together. Someone says, how do these mindsets get to those in business and political arena? Um, and the other one that relates is, how do we deal with vested interests, those who are working hard to maintain business as usual and the status quo? Uh, you know, how do you, in the work that you do, how do you find breaking through against these barriers in terms of, <clears throat> get them to think in that systems, those mindsets, basically. 
Yeah, it's it's a really good point. We've got to bear in mind that there is a massive the system is functioning very well. Thank you very much as, as we see it at the moment. And there's vested interest. We have a massive resilience. We saw the financial crash that how the system actually was quite resilient. We thought it was going to change and it hasn't. We're thinking mm -hmm. the world is changing very much at the moment. And actually we we actually have created quite quite resilient structures and systems, but it's not really serving us for planetary health. And so how do we get and engage people and businesses and politicals? I mean, that is that's been the last 20 years of my my career of trying to educate people and engage them. And I think there's there's something about working all these differences as well, tapping into their own personal experience, tapping into their sense of agency and what they do in their world. Uh, and kind of when we actually work with people, we realize that not people get that the system isn't quite working. You know, actually, people do see that. But it's about how do we find practical wells to help them to work with the alternatives and create communities of businesses. We've worked business for many years or, or government officials, whoever we're working with to kind of create the, the courage to go on that journey and say, well, how do we how do we start affecting that change? How do we start uh, working against vested interests? So it's not it's not a one size fits all. It's kind of quite a hard slog of building relationships, building connections and helping people work with that new new way. Just as a, a kind of shout out, we'll hear more about that business mentality when we hear from John Elkington later on today. But in terms of question that came up, and this was a question, uh, Anna, that vexed us a lot in the assembly, which was the role of the individual versus the role of the collective and, and kind of higher up the food chain, really. And there's a question from, I think it's Ayla saying, mindsets are part of individual and collective psychology. How do you suggest to change people's psychology um, that's a lovely question I love I'm getting very excited about some of the psychology and I think you're right we've got to really recognize that our individual psychology is totally just part of the norms and we have to kind of first notice that and notice how we frame things like build back better is a, it's quite a narrative of like actually we just need to go back to kind of where we are with a little bit extra and is that good enough you know so some of these narratives and cultural narratives um, what is the cultural psychology and how are we framing things how are we changing uh, the way we talk about change and the way we talk about the world needs to shift as well to help us kind of see our identity and who we are in a different way. So I think there's a lot of work and we're not doing enough work, I think, in, in, in trying to trying to change the narrative and change kind of how we see ourselves in the world, our framing of ourselves. And I love the reframing. You know, George Monbiot changed, uh, helped us change and think about that idea of from climate change to climate emergency or um, just being honest about climate breakdown and the language we can use actually can have a real effect on, on understanding the issue but also the relationship we have with with some of these issues as well so a great question i think we need to do more work in this area to be honest with you we're not we're not looking at it enough yeah it's interesting we had a, a, a kevin anderson yesterday was was obviously well he was talking about the problems with net zero as a concept and the dangers of it and it was interesting mm -hmm. that sophie thomas later on who made a point about saying actually net zero for her and the business is quite useful because it's a, a bridge for people they've signed up to the climate emergency net zero and then they say what the hell is it what did i do what do i need to do and then you get into i guess what you're talking about there um claire pen mm -hmm. question what about people without agency how do we engage those communities that are on the margin in this kind of system thing? Yeah. And and I'd like to say that everyone does have agency. There's just a lot of marginalization happening. So there's a sense of how much we can, you know, that that's the process of those who are privileged and more in the center of uh, of systems need to also recognize their own power and privilege. And people do have the power. You know, that's why we are seeing more uprisings, more issues like Black Lives Matter, more protesting, because people are saying, well, how can I be heard? How can I be heard? And so how can we do that in a way where we actually are creating a society that is participatory, that is enabling voice to be heard, like like assemblies, like citizen assemblies. How do we how do we actively uh, those people in power invite that in? And that is the way that we need to change decision making. So there's some real big questions for me about the process of governance and decision making that really can help us on that transform uh, trajectory, which is saying we need to recognise that marginalisation and really change the governance structures. Uh, to engage people, but also not to assume that people don't have agency. A lot of people do. They, they might not feel it. And that's that is valid. That's their lived experience. But also they are they are making choices on a daily basis about their lives. Mm. And how do we help them uh, release that that sense of, of agency as well? I'm sure that's something that Claire absolutely endorses. And can I bring in this one from Paul Barnard? Paul is Director of Planning at the Council. So that's a, a kind of filter to his questions. 
It says, and if I've understood this correctly, your work draws on the concepts of system thinking, but I was wondering, are there any specific examples where this approach has delivered a different approach at national or local level? So, I mean, there's a lot of different change makers and I'm trying to think of, you know, we, I know that Camden Council, for example, are using systems thinking uh, to really understand how they address sustainability issues, trying to understand their policy orientations, how they, how they make decisions. So it, it, it's very much a decision making tool or, or a reflective tool in terms of how they're bringing it into whatever, whatever issue. When our courses at the School of Systems Change, we have people who work across different sectors who who are basically trying to say, this is the problem in front of me. I have this problem about plastics or I have a problem about social equity or, or in Camden, exactly planning issues. Um, so I, I'm trying, I'm racking my brain of a, a, a unique sort of answer to what the, what the, I guess one of our projects we're looking at is like, how do we transform the, the protein system? How do we actually change the way that we, we uh, eat meat? The meat is the problem. And we mm -hmm. at Forum reframed it and say, well, how do we reach our protein needs? So we we brought together multiple businesses as well as campaigners and others as a collaboration to, to really think about how do we work together? How do we understand the problem and work together? And so we therefore work with chefs about reframing what the future of our plate to actually mm -hmm. uh, Comp um, people like Waitrose who started putting um, more vegetable pro veggie products out there. So I guess one of our approaches is how do you start the conversation and facilitate the conversation and bring people together? Um, so sorry, that's not very clear on a planning perspective. I don't have one off the top of my hat there, but well, yeah. We may follow up, but no, that's been really useful in those specific examples. Um, Judith kicked us off in talking about the importance of universities. Um, and, and obviously we are places where there's huge potential for transformation. Um, but, you know, now that I've got you here, how, if you were going to do this, what would your top nine thoughts in terms of how universities should change in order to really be able to tackle the climate emergency, et cetera? Yeah, and you're talking to somebody whose passion is actually education and the education system. I started my career at WWF working in education. Um, and I think there's something about what we, how we not create silos in universities, like how do we have transdisciplinary research? How do we actually have conversations that link both the science, um, the numbers, as well as the social and psychological? How does this become valid approaches? And maybe speaking to somebody who did my doctorate and was kind of really struggling with saying, well, actually taking the systems approach is bringing together all these different types of, and you know, it's very hard to justify some of it by saying, you've got too many, you're doing too many things, you're researching across. And I really had to argue that, you know, actually look, breadth, breadth was actually depth, you know, so breadth is depth in research. So I think there's some things about universities about how do we break down our department silos and what kind of thinking and what new ways of thinking is needed. And yes, you need to look at universities and their, their, their campuses and all the work they need to do there. But actually, the function of the university is, is what are we learning and how are we seeing ourselves uh, and our education of the future? That's their biggest impact they can have. And so how do they how do they reframe what research is about? How do they get more practitioners in? I'm obsessed about this. Sorry, you've got me on my hobby horse here about how do we really blend research with people with lived experience and practitioners, as well as people who are who are perhaps more from the theoretical side and, and really make that a part of the change we need to see. That is the deep systemic work that needs to happen across education systems at the moment. Fantastic. Great place to end. I mean, you're, in a way, you're describing the SEI, but SEI, Sustainable Earth Institute, but it needs to be permeated through the institution, not just a little pimple on the top. So fantastic. I think we'll draw it to a close there and get, allow people time to mosey and go into the next session. Anna, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for kicking us off in this, this second day. And I hope it's been interesting to you. And I certainly hope it's been interesting to everyone listening. Thank you very much. And I'll, I'll get us to leave the room. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lovely to meet you all.